Uh, the first question, um, as Amy has said, I'm from the Center for Human Rights and Global Justice. So the first question is from a legal perspective. Uh, we're wondering, uh, we understand that you have an appeal to be heard on October the 1st. Uh, and we're at, wondering if you could please take us through the legal arguments uh, that you'll be putting forward at the hearing and let us know what role, if any, international law and international human rights will play in your response and in the response of the government. And finally, uh, how you see the role of political pressure on the outcome of appeal versus the role of law. Thank you. Mark Fagan, um, one of the lawyers for Pussy Riot, will answer. Mm -hmm. yes. Yes. Uh, we really, on October 1st, are taking part in a, in a, constitu in a, in a constitutional re-examination of the case. This is very important to note. This is not an appeal because Russian legislation doesn't know what doesn't have a, a, doesn't have appeals on this for, for this category on this stage of a crime appeals okay so the the moment of cassation comes in only with Okay, this is um, the um, cassation point is just uh, examining the constitutionality of a um, yeah. decision. This, this is only a one day re examination. Uh, there will be no witnesses. There will not be any studying of the written evidence. There won't be any new evidence or anything like that. This is just in the framework of a constitutional complaint about um, the, the arguments of the sides here. This is in many ways a holdover of Soviet law because the second uh, level of the, the, the constitutional uh, level um, of, for this sort of case is really the last, the last place you can um, re-examine a, a uh, decision. There are other um, oversight um, bodies, but they really are not um, important for the re-examination of the case. The thing is that this case is a political case. It does not have really any, um, any juridical foundation because our defendants are, are absolutely innocent. They, they um, committed an administrative offense. This is a, a little fine and that's it. There is an article in the Administrative Codex that says $30 and a fine for this. But, but, but in the soft authoritarian system of Putin as it is now, such political uh, offenses are evaluated not according to the letter of the law, but from political uh, from a political standpoint only. Therefore, in this case, we as lawyers don't um, separate ourselves from our defendants. Of course, the most important the most important condition of, of an attorney's work is, in fact, to do that. But political, but political um, legal advocacy in Russia is possible only if the attorney and the um, the attorney and their um, defendants and the people um, who represent them um, completely identify their common interests of the lawyers and the defendants.
We, as lawyers, are part of a po political protest in Russia. And therefore, only, only such attorneys can, um, could be chosen by our uh, defendants. This is not just a, a question of law. This is a question of a political struggle. The attorney who, an attorney whom they trust will never betray them, won't make a deal with the authorities, and for them this is the, the, the most important argument in, um, in favor of choosing us as their attorneys. We understand that this sounds a bit unnatural for the those people, young, young um, jurists here, but please, um, but please make allowances for the fact that you're dealing with an authoritarian system. And um, beyond the impossible, um, th this, is the only way, this is the only way that we can um, insist on civil rights. The, um, a, a, a straightforward conflict with the system. The only way to defend our, uh, the people we're defending is to ha go into an open confrontation over political con confrontation. The point of this, this political confrontation is law. Uh, the current system in Russia, the current legal system in Russia, is very distantly, is, um, is, a, is a somewhat distantly like the national socialist system, or like, like um, a, corporate of, a corporate state in Italy, where law is limited by pol political will of the ruling of the leading class. And the law can um, be ignored in the interests of this class. If it, is, in, if it is needed for Putin's system, then the law simply ceases to uh, function. In, in the case of Pussy Riot, as in other political cases, the law doesn't play any um, real role. And I would also like to emphasize that the participants of Pussy Riot are not just a punk, a feminist punk uh, group. They are political oppositionists. This is very symptomatic. <laughs> And their, um, and, and their performance has to be um, understood as a, as a uh, challenge to the political system. This, the second thing that they're interested in is they're interested in um, the, the, um, the, the, the deals between the um, system and the church. That's what they're also interested in. But first of all, um, this is a political challenge, a political protest, and outrage about an outrage over the lawless election that took place in Russia. I've said that maybe my, my colleagues would like to answer. I think that was enough. Okay, I would also like to say something. First of all, Besides the Pussy Riot case, in Russia there are several political cases. And one of them is the case of, of um, March 6th, May 6th, when um, right before the, the, on the eve of, of Putin's inauguration of the so-called president, the citizens went out to, um, for a peaceful demonstration and the authorities set the police on the people in order to, to bring in the mechanism for freezing um, civil liberties. Besides, besides the fact that in this case um, about um, 15 people have already been arrested, in this case, as witnesses, almost all the leaders of the, of the um, opposition in Russia are uh, involved. The nature of the cr of criminal trials in Russia is such that the decision is being is made um, by the investigator. The, the investigator, once he brings someone into the into the process, even as a witness, um, 
it just by with one uh, flick of the pen can make him turn him from a witness into an accused. Therefore, all the leaders of the protest are on, on the authority's hook. At any moment, the leadership um, could, out of um, political considerations, just um, put them in prison. Two of my colleagues, Violeta Volkova and Mark Fagan, also are involved in this case as witnesses. And this is done um, only so that they can be under pressure um, and that, the, that, that there be, the pressure is put um, on them in the connection with the Pussy Riot case. The authorities really don't like it, the position of, of attorneys who don't make deals with them. Essentially, the role of an attorney in such a corrupt uh, system of um, law and order can be reduced to the role of, of someone who brings money from the client either to the investigator or to the court. And a certain number of attorneys are perfectly happy with the situation. But we are not happy with the situation. We think that the status of an attorney does not allow an, uh, an attorney to, to violate the, uh, the ethical code and the oath that he gives when he receives his, the status. And, there, and therefore, we, st we started to defend the political activists since in such political cases, the corrupt, the corrupt, so that in such political cases, the corrupt side of things just can't work. And so it work, So what we get is is uh, pure work, good work. So trying to take the um, attorneys out of the Pussy Riot case, the, the authorities are trying to pressure us, and maybe when we come back to Moscow, they could either Violeta or Mark, they could arrest either Violeta or Mark for, out of some sort of trumped up charge. A separate issue is the media pressure on, on the part of the state, since the state TV channels are creating, are creating their own particular image of the people that the authorities don't like. From the very beginning of the Pussy Riot case, in the course of uh, over the over six months, on all the leading TV stations in the country, which are all in some way or another under the control of the state, our defendants have been have been shown in the most in the most horrible light. They have been presented as as blasphemers. In other words, blasphemers. As people who are not worthy of the name human. And these people who watch TV, TV and, um, and are not critical about the information that is given to them, they believe this. Therefore, when we had a, a trial, the authorities, in the same way, um, were characterizing the attorneys. And now they say that the attorneys are the ones who put them in jail. That the, that the, that the, that the, the judge and the, the prosecutor wanted to release them, but the attorneys um, put them in jail, which is just absolutely absurd because the attorneys don't have the authority to put people in prison. They can only get people out and free, and free them. So, in order to provide a basis for why there be why the attorneys would put them in prison, they say the authorities say these aren't, aren't attorneys; these are extremely liberal politicians, and, and they are scoring political points in this case. I don't know if, if prison counts as political points, but it's close; it's it's on the horizon. Therefore, it's very important to understand that in Russia. Despite the fact that there is a constitution, there are laws, the majority of these laws are purely declarative. In fact, they just are not implemented and in, in political cases. In other cases, everything is decided for money, in, in, almost all the, in most of the cases. 
And in this connection, I think that, that it's absolutely correct that here there is an understanding of the fact that this is a political case. This is very important to understand. This is not a criminal case. This is just a, exclusively a criminal case. Thank you. Next um, on, our, we, on our list of questioners is um, my esteemed colleague, Bert Newborn from the law school. Wait, you may not applaud when you've heard the question. Um, uh, I'm, uh, I, um, am deep, I deeply admire the courage and the purpose uh, behind the um, um, provocation that the Pussy Riot um, uh, uh, engaged in. And I urge you all to read the final statements that they made to the court uh, on August 8th. Each of the imprisoned young women made a remarkable final statement to the court, which is available on the internet and which should be read because it um, explains the political um, and social context of their acts um, really quite brilliantly. Um, now, having said that, though, um, my, my question is a narrow one, and it's, it's a legal one. Um, they they um, staged their provocation on the altar of a religious sanctuary um, um, in a way that inevitably had to be offensive to the believers. Uh, who truly believe in, um, in the, that religious uh, doctrine. And my question to you is, um, should, should there be a, um, a law against staging provocations in religious settings that deeply offend the sensibilities of the believers? And is what, is what we really are reacting against here the indefensible barbarity of a two-year sentence uh, for what is a provocation that perhaps could be punished by some minor infraction, but that has been raised to a political level um, in an attempt to deter other people from uh, protesting. I will answer. The thing is that you won't believe, but we have a law like that. And, and my, my colleague Mark Fagan was just speaking about that. This is an administrative law that, that um, gives a, that, that, that has a punishment for offending the believers. And theoretically, when such things happen, they are punished specifically that way, with a fine. We don't even have the, the possibility of, of temporary imprisonment, imprisonment for such uh, violations. And therefore, in this situation, in this particular situation, um, the, entire, um, the entire community of lawyers supports us. The, because this administrative law should have been applied. And this is both. This is both um, communities of lawyers. Before, in all the in, in all the history of um, of attorneys' actions in in um, Russia, there's never been a time when when attorney when the attorneys' associations have made public statements like this um, about a ca case that is being um, conducted by other attorneys. This is the first time in history for of, of more than 100 years when attor that attorneys have signed a, a collective letter in which they express their outrage about the actions of the authorities and their solidarity with our group of attorneys, of attorneys about this particular case. We didn't expect such a reaction. We weren't um, prepared. We didn't prepare them. And for us, this was a, a surprise when this, pu when this letter was published. Uh, and I, the second, I had a second uh, brief question. Um, the, I, you can't help but admire the courage of the three lawyers who are defending. Um, and you mentioned that there might be some action taken against you 
Um, I wonder if you could be more specific about the risks that the lawyers are running. So, and what, if anything, we in the United States can do uh, to help minimize those risks? Very quickly here. You know, in connection with this case, yes, really, for us as attorneys, there is a, there is a, a big risk. My colleague Nikolai Polos have already said that we are subject to um, to being called um, to, to a committee in Russia to be to give um, to give testimony as witnesses um, for a criminal the criminal case of May sixth. On the, we, we were indeed at that um, protest and we supported our defendants. We represented, uh, we represented, I'm sorry, we represented the interests of the leaders of the protests, of Russian protests. We are defending Sergei Udaltsov, one of the leaders, Alexei Navalny, another important leader, Nimsov, another one, and others, other leaders. So um, we were there because we were there as attorneys um, doing our jobs. We don't have the right to be interrogated by the authorities for this. We don't, we, there are federal laws in Russia. There are inter, there's international law. So the Constitutional Court of, we've gone to the Constitutional Court of Russia for this. But this does not interest the um, investigation. My, my colleague Fagan was interrogated, was questioned about this case. And I was summoned twice um, to an investigator. And twice I refused to come. I made a public statement um, about this. But when I return to Russia, I'm, I'm, I'm waiting. I'm, I expect a forced, um, a, a forced summons and maybe a, a search, which will therefore violate the rights of my defendants. Unfortunately, to do something in Russia about this is impossible. You can only battle it after the fact. And I'm just going to add a, 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 a bit. Uh, at this protest where there was a huge confrontation with the police, I was on, I was on the stage at the, at the culminating point, and I, 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 and I called for, the, for people to sit, to have a sit-in um, protest. My words could be under, understood according to a particular law of the criminal code as a um, call to mass disorder. Uh, this, this recording has been put on the internet, and I have been shown it for, um, for identification. And they gave, and they, and they asked me why I summoned people to, um, why I told people to sit. Since since, law is, since, since uh, the law doesn't really work, this could be considered a um, call to mass disorder. And such things happen all the time. And I had this time. Oh, I had a situation, more a funnier situation. Oh, I had the an organizer, an organizer's ba badge hanging on my neck, mm -hmm. and that's it. That was enough. Um, the fabulous Miss Barbara Browning from the Department of Performance Studies. Um, thank you. Uh, at a recent panel also here at NYU that was actually organized by Elliot, who's translating, um, <clears throat> it, which was also on the Pussy Riot case, concerns similar to those of uh, Professor Newborn, who spoke uh, earlier, were expressed regarding offending religious sensibilities. These were some of the same concerns that were expressed in December of 1989 when members of the AIDS activist group ACT UP staged an action in St. Patrick's Cathedral, many of them lying down on the floor of the church in a massive die-in. About 150 people were arrested. Ed Koch, who was mayor at the time, recently noted, that the, noted the similarities between the ACT UP and the Pussy Riot actions and actually expressed, I'm quoting, delight in Putin's firm response to what he characterized as religious hatred. 
But at the time of the ACT UP action, many of those arrested presented themselves as deeply invested Catholics for whom their protest constituted a sincere act of faith within the church. In fact, one former seminarian who was arrested said, the strongest prayer I've ever made in my life was on the floor of St. Patrick's Cathedral. So my question is, to what extent would you characterize Pussy Riot's action as a religious, not an anti-religious act? And what would the legal implications of acknowledging that a feminist prayer might be an act of faith? Listen, for, they were, they were there for 40 seconds. They were not on the altar. They were in front of it. This is, this is a, a, a raised a bit. This is that women, women aren't allowed there. Yes, they are. <laughs> there is no there is no direct um, there is no direct decree saying that you can't do that. But the tradition is that women are not supposed to be on this particular spot. Forty seconds. They just gave a very quick speech in forty seconds. And then they got on their knees and they crossed themselves. I don't see anything here that is blasphemous. I don't see anything here that is hurting the feelings of um, the believers. Of the three women who were arrested and two are um, hiding, three of them are, are um, Russian Orthodox believers and um, church members. Надежда Толоконникова is, is more an, of an agnostic, and only Yekaterina Samutsevich, um, though she was um, baptized, is an atheist. And so you understand there was no violent character to this action. And, and the violent character is what's essential for this particular law. They didn't resist. They didn't violate the uh, rituals because there was no liturgy at the time. They didn't um, break a single church object. They didn't, um, they didn't offend anyone with their actions. They didn't strip. They didn't offend anyone in front of them. This was a short political action that, that, sh that should have been uh, punished administratively. They should have had to pay a fine. And, and, that, um, and you can see that from the materials of the case. But no one cares. They were just put in prison. Thank you. Next, um, another esteemed colleague from the NYU School of Law, Stephen Holmes. Thanks. Um, so I'm a little surprised that you haven't mentioned the nature of the cathedral in which the video was taken. It, 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 could you say a little bit about how the cathedral has a political role in Russian uh, the, in, the, in the Putin scene, and that it's different from a small church in a in a village somewhere. Okay, so it's the f first. If I can ask a second question, so the first question was about saying something about what the Kram is and how it how it functions politically. But you've said all of you that uh, this is a political case, not a legal case. But you haven't said much really about the politics. So what, can you help us understand, one, what was motivating, what's motivating the Kremlin? Putting Kordakovsky in jail makes sense. You can steal his company. But as far as I know, there was nothing here to steal, actually, in this case. They are not very powerful actors. So what, did they, what were they trying to do? Who were they trying to intimidate? Uh, uh, is there a huge punk? opposition that they're going to chill? No, that doesn't seem to make sense. Are they trying to mobilize uh, traditionalist support against the Moscow crowds? Is that what's going on? So if you could tell us what the purpose was, and then have they succeeded or not in doing these things? First, as far uh, about the um, the Church of Christ the Savior, the Church of Christ the Savior was blown up in the 30s by the communists. Then there was a large swimming pool. 
an, an open swimming, open air swimming pool. Yeah. And after the Soviet yeah. Union fell apart, um, they decided to restore the cathedral. Um, they, they filled in the swimming pool and they built up the cathedral, but it became a different cathedral. Besides the actual construction, there was a, there's a, a whole complex there. There's a hall of um, of church. Uh, there's a hall of church uh, cathedrals. There's some cafes and there's a car wash and, and offices and offices. And offices for some of our co colleagues who are lawyers. <laughs> Since uh, most of now the 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 um, and since you're all a, 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 since you're attorneys here, you understand that the um, ownership of this cathedral belongs to the government of Moscow, not to uh, the church. The church takes only a small part, basically rents a small part. Uh, everything else is um, not a religious spot. So, but, so they say the, the, the punk prayer in the Church of Christ Cathedral is bad. But, not, but really, in this, in this little um, area, this church area that's just 10 meters from the altar, in May, the, the Bonnie M group, which is a... Um, the, uh, uh, sang and danced there, and no one had any questions or complaints about this pop group singing there. And there were icons there. Therefore, as far as the sacred role of this, this cathedral goes, um, this is absolutely um, something new. <laughs> that has no spirituality in it whatsoever. There's only business. And one other thing. The church on the ter territory of this cathedral um, sells, ca sells candles, gold crosses. There's a lot of, um, there's a lot of precious metals going through there and, and souvenirs. So the, the, uh, the Hamovnici court that, um, that convicted Pussy Riot at first, in the beginning of the summer, decided that everything that gets sold in this uh, cathedral of Christ the Savior is not, it's not about um, buying and selling. These, uh, um, instead, you're, you're um, giving donations um, rather than buying and selling. And, and this is just a fake um, deal. But but um, thanks to the um, power of the patriarchate, the uh, court felt that this is just perfectly normal, that the, this fake deal. Oh, um, now, why this particular place was chosen for the action of Pussy Riot? The thing is that the church, but the church is separate from the state according to law. Uh, but three days before the event, the patriarch announced to all believers, and the, the, the patriarch for, for all, all the um, believers is, is they're holy, and, he, and what he commands is, is um, obligatory to all believers. But the patriarch said that, believer, that Orthodox believers should not go to protests. He forbade them to go to mass protests. And he also, he also basically called on them to he vote for Putin. He said, I believe in Putin. <laughs> the young women in their song saying, the patriarch Kirill believes in Putin. He should believe in God, but he believes in Putin. So basically, from, because of all this, um, they chose this particular cathedral, and Petra Kirill um, is um, in charge of this cathedral, therefore they chose this one, they came to this one. And to continue, our assistant, Alisa, shall tell a little bit about, um, about who this message was for. Um, first of all, based on what my colleagues have said, 
We should, you should understand that the uh, participants of Pussy Riot were uh, bringing um, Russia's, um, Russia's and the whole world's attention to the problem of this, this um, concord between the church and the state. Before it, the, the be, before this um, action, before this performance, you could say with complete certainty that few people in, in Russia were thinking thinking about this problem of church and state. Therefore, the women were addressing the entire country. And first of all, the, um, the young people who, who, had, um, who in December had taken part in these um, mass protests, December of last year. They were addressing also the older generations. And, and you can say, and we can say with complete certainty that they achieved their goal because now the most tense discussion in Russia is the discussion about the existence of God and the extent of his, his um, influence on people's minds. And this question and people are answering this question not in the church. They're arguing about this on the street. So this is the case when the question of the existence of God has become a political question. Okay. Um, next on my list is the great Jason Schultz, from, also from NYU School of Law. Thanks. So I study um, online media and social media and the use of the internet um, and how it impacts freedom of expression. And um, I find the Pussy Riot situation very interesting because um, some people will put things online anonymously um, or they'll only be online, but this was a physical, Im an act in a particular place, which then also was online. And um, while it seems that because in Russia, uh, much of the media is state-owned, that the internet has enabled this uh, video and much of the message to get out to a broader audience and perhaps even to keep it from being taken offline by Putin or some of the government. I wonder if also, as you suggested um, with your experience, that also filming people and putting it online could potentially be used against activists too. And so there might be some tension between reaching an audience, but also um, the online media being used against activists. And I'm just wondering um, how you all feel about this at, in terms of the use of online media. How has it helped and um, how has it hurt it at all in the political movement that you're part of? The thing is that here you can't choose. The internet is this um, free, is this free um, medium that is, that is not being controlled or censored by the government and serves as a way of spreading information, free information. If there were another way, if there were free mass media, free traditional mass media, then, then the Russian opposition would, have, would use them uh, widely, would use the mass media widely. You properly said that the internet is also dangerous for political activists because um, the, the clip of, um, of the punk prayer appeared on the same day uh, um, on the internet. So, so argument, our argument with the um, investigation was that, that if they wanted to uh, if they, if they wanted to get them for the composition of this punk prayer, then, it, then, the prob, then it appeared in the internet. 
um, but not in the church because it wasn't heard in the church. The composition um, in the clip lasts for more than three minutes. But um, but in the church they only were able to, to perform for 40, 40 seconds. So there is a different law about extremism that um, that also was used um, for an examination of the materials um, by the investigation. And so it's possible that there could be a second case for the clip, for the video, because they have been sentenced for what happened in the church. And they are, sent, they are sentenced for what happened in the church. The argument about what the what the crime actually is. Was there um, a motivation of religious hatred? Which, um, as, uh, according to the subjective side of the crime, is the is essential, an essential characteristic of this particular law, um, according to which they were um, sentenced. So the, the video. Не является предметом рассмотрения уголовного дела. The video is not part of the examination of the um, criminal case. А только из него можно было But only from this video can you um, figure out. Only from from the video could you possibly get this motif of religious hatred. Но проблема для следствия. the problem for the investigation в том, что is that this, this law has only is only a medium um, seriousness. И если бы уголовное дело было if по criminal, if a criminal case were were um, brought up for this particular law, they, could, they couldn't have been um, held in preventive detention. But they were imprisoned because they were used a criminal, um, a criminal, uh, okay, they, they used a criminal law that makes it more serious, that allows for the possibility of up to seven years imprisonment. And therefore, in this way, we think this is also an expression of the political motivation of the authorities in order, who wanted to just um, to deal with the, the pussy riot group. And this is not the first, this is by no means the first action, um, public action of pussy riot. A few weeks before that, they did an action on, um, on Red Square. Um, with with um, the um, composition that um, put, that Putin pissed himself, <laughs> and, and they got a fine for that. So ruling to rule out that the authorities will continue to um, persecute to, pros, to persecute the other um, the other participants and the defendants. Well, this can't be ruled out. They could still go after them.